Welcome to this new podcast entitled A Grand Tour with My Great Great Granddad. My name is Ed Hill. I think it's uh, best if I begin with a bit of an introduction or, or backstory about the podcasts. Obviously, firstly, I need to explain what they're about, then what you can expect to hear in them, and then uh, how the series is going to progress. So this introduction has to be quite lengthy to uh, really give the full context of the podcasts and, and their background. So I've done this introduction, as it were, so you can listen to it sort of separately before the main part of the podcast begins. So you can always listen again to this introduction just to remind yourself if you need to, about the history of my great-great-granddad and why I embarked on recording this series. So I suppose the first question I should answer is, why is it called The Grand Tour with my great-great-granddad? Well, if you Google The Grand Tour, the first thing that will come at the top of the search results will be a television programme with Jeremy Clarkson and his chums doing sort of daft things with cars. But, of course, they're referencing in the title of that programme the original Grand Tour, which was, as some of you may know, a journey that was undertaken around Europe, usually by aristocratic young men in the 17th to mid-19th century, to take in all the cultural delights that could be found in Europe. In a way, it was a kind of sort of rites of passage for wealthy young aristocratic men to go through before they went into their more mature years. Your average grand tourer was probably a young man of about 21 years of age, and quite often they'd be accompanied by a sort of chaperone, an older person who would show them the ropes, as it were, of uh, the grand tour. Probably someone had done it themselves when they were their age. It wasn't exclusively young men, but it was primarily young men. And of course, the Grand Tour would normally end up, after they'd travelled through Europe, they would normally end up in Italy, because of course, Italy, if you like, with its long history dating back to Roman times, and places like uh, Rome and Florence and uh, Venice, is the cultural centre of Europe, particularly in the sort of classical sense. So that whole, if you like, classical culture was very much the thing that these young men were being sent out to experience. So, you know, it was a, it was a bit like a kind of 18th century version of going backpacking or doing a gap year that uh, young people do today. And like those experiences, um, it has to be said, it wasn't all entirely cultural. There was a big social element to it too. People like Boswell and Lord Byron had done the Grand Tour, so they also had um, extracurricular, <laughs> extracurricular experiences with young ladies as well. So that was all part of the experience that these young men were meant to be taking in. So at this point, I should say, what has this got to do with my great great granddad? Well, my great great granddad's name was William Mowbray Scott. And he is my great-great-grandfather on my mother's side. My mother's maiden name was Valerie Caroline Scott. So it's all on that side of my family. And William was not a member of the aristocracy, unfortunately. My heritage does not go back to the grand houses of old England. He was an engineer in the 1840s and because of his profession he did in fact do very much what was an equivalent of a grand tour and in fact 
then went further afield around the world to primarily Mexico. And the reason that I know all this is because William wrote a series of journals in which he recounts all the experiences that he's had on his travels. The reason William undertakes this journey throughout Europe is because in the very early days of steam, he gets employed to work on a railway as an engine driver and engineer for a railway in Italy, which basically runs from Milan to Venice. I say in Italy, at that time, 1840, Italy itself wasn't actually a unified country. It was still a series or collection of um, sort of kingdoms and dukedoms, places like Savoy and Lombardy, Venetia and Sardinia and other ones that I can't quite remember now. But William gets employed to work on the railway in Lombardy, Venetia, which is basically in the Milan area. And this is virtually the first, if you like, proper passenger or commercial railway in Italy. Um, there was one very small railway line built further south in Italy uh, by some wealthy duke to take him from his palace to the beach. But the railway that William ends up working on is the first passenger railway in Italy. Weirdly, in fact, it's the development of the railways and the fact that travel then becomes actually a much more easily available experience for many more people puts an end to the Grand Tour. So you could say William is doing his travels very much right at the end of the Grand Tour's heyday. So William's journey involves him travelling down to the railway. He works there in the Milan area for about two years. Then he travels all the way back through uh, Europe this time sort of going initially he travels out going down through France and across the Alps that way when he travels back with his family he then returns sort of going through um, Switzerland and Germany and then Belgium I think and then back to the UK and then about 18 months later he then travels by paddle steamer across the Atlantic taking in uh, places like uh, the Caribbean uh, on his way to end up in Mexico where he travels to the centre of Mexico to a place called Zacatecas where he's employed to work in the mint or coin making industry. At that time there were quite a lot of people from Europe involved in the mining and precious metals industry in Mexico and William is one of these people. So you may be asking yourself, quite sensibly, Ed, you sound incredibly young. How come William is just your great-great-grandfather and not your great-great-great-great-great-great? I don't know how many greats. Well, the reason for that, just to explain my family history a little bit, is that my grandfather, Archibald Scott, who I never knew, had my mum when he was pretty old. He was um, in his 50s. He was 50, uh, 55, uh, I think. Or 58. I mean, I say old. It's not old because, I mean, I'm, I'm in my 50s now anyway. So, <coughs> 51. Uh, uh, but he died way back in 1939 at the age of 58. So he was born in the latter part of the 19th century. And then his father, Edward, my great-grandfather, who I'm named after, which I now realise is why I'm named Edward, because my mum never said why she'd give me the name Edward or I'd have never asked. One, one of the two. Um, anyway, my great-grandfather, Edward Scott, Edward Joseph Scott, he was born in Mexico, in Zacatecas. And I know this because I've seen a census of when he's um, returned back to the UK in about 1861. And on the far column, it says place of birth and in rather difficult to read writing, but it is there, Zacatecas, Mexico, brackets, British subject. I think he wanted to stress the British subject bit. <laughs> Mexico, but I'm still British. Uh, and actually in the journals there is a reference by William to a son being born in Zacatecas in Mexico around about 1847. Now I don't know for certain that this was Edward because the name that he gives 
the child in the journals. Although it does have the name Edward in it, it's not his first name. And sadly, because of the very high levels of infant mortality at that time, it's possible that the child referenced in the journals by William isn't actually Edward. But I, I think it probably is. I think what it happened was when it actually came round to christening him, they gave him a slightly different name. Finally, at this point, I should say that William, he actually ends up dying in Mexico. Because as far as I know, and from what my mother told me, William died in Mexico. And these journals were brought all the way back to London by his wife Mary with her young family so she must have been quite a formidable lady given all the perils that could happen to people travelling in these places at that time should mention a little bit about the journals themselves. They've been passed down my family all these years on my mother's side. They've never been published or printed anywhere before, so they are in many ways a unique account of that time. And really the reason this podcast came about was I started to read the journals after my dad, Ken, my mum was Valerie and my dad was Ken, had them bound. He had them, he'd read them in about the 1990s and he saw that they were pretty well an important document and he decided to get them rebound. So that has very much kept them preserved um, because, as you can imagine, they were all originally handwritten and they had got in quite a bad state, particularly the covers. So my dad decided it'd be a good idea to get them rebound, which he did by a bookbinder company in Canterbury. And then I came across them later in life and started to read them. But I thought it would be a good idea to transcribe them into more modern day prints to read rather than in the handwritten sort of copper plate style with which William writes them back in the 1840s, which at times is difficult to decipher. And I embarked on that exercise many years ago uh, in about 2008. And I'd completed the first journal, I should say, the journals are in three volumes. I completed the first journal and got about halfway through the second. And then life and things like that, children, other things came along and have made it a bit harder to continue doing it. But COVID came along. I was furloughed for a long time. And so during that time of being furloughed, whilst trying to educate my children as well, pretty well unsuccessfully, I should say, I was able to complete transcribing these journals mainly by voice recognition software and of course in doing that I needed to look into some of the history that William refers to and some of the people and places that he mentions to really understand sometimes what he was talking about what he was referring to and that became a very interesting exercise in itself learning about all this history that of course I wasn't really aware of and I must say thanks to particularly Wikipedia do give to it if you can and other online resources, that task of researching these things was quite quick. You know, if I'd had to go to a library and do it, you know, it would have been a project that would have taken me years to do. But um, in the end, I managed to complete it in, I suppose, about eight months, what with juggling the kids' needs as well. So I should just say, the three volumes, basically the first two are described by William as recollections. In fact, all the journals are written while he's in Mexico. So the first two journals are him reflecting and looking back on his time, not that earlier, only a few years earlier, travelling through Europe to be an engineer on the railway in Italy. So the first journal is written about William's journey down from the UK, travelling through France and then across the Alps to Italy. And then the next two journals, the next one is a bit more of his time in Italy and then his travels back and then the first part of that is then his account of travelling across the Atlantic to Mexico and his travels into the centre of Mexico to Zacatecas. 
So those first two journals are written as he looks back at his time spent in Europe and travelling to Mexico. And I think he must be working from some notes that he'd written at the time. And obviously I think he probably had some reference books with him as well, which I'm sure he uses for a few facts and figures. And sometimes he refers to those in the journal. And sometimes he actually directly um, quotes other extracts that have been written by other authors about the places he'd been to. Although ma it's mainly his recollections of the places he's been to. And actually, part of the reason he undertakes writing these journals is because his wife and family don't join him in Mexico for a good couple of years after he's arrived there. So he says at one point, this is really an undertaking to explain to mainly my children, the people and places, things that we have seen while they were very young. And I think basically... He's got a lot of time on his hands in the evenings in Mexico, so this seemed to be something good to do to pass the time. The third volume is a more, if like, concurrent account of William's time in Mexico, and it does happen to coincide with a very interesting time in that country's history, and also the United States' history, because he's there in the 1840s during the Mexican-United States War, in which the USA massively expanded its territory, it won the war and it took over a large part of Mexican territory, which we now consider to be the United States. So places like California, Texas, um, Arizona, all these large areas, I would say almost probably a third, maybe a bit more than a third of what we know as the United States today before this war was actually Mexican territory. And William is in Mexico during the time when this war is happening. So that account is much more contemporaneous of what's going on in there. And in that regard, there's a lot more references to newspaper articles, other things that have been written, uh, letters that are published, pronouncements from governments and politicians about what's happening at the time. Also, and it goes into quite a bit of detail about the workings of the mint and also, perhaps importantly, the mining industry associated with the mint and coins because, of course, coins at that time were made from precious metals such as gold and silver. And particularly on the silver side of things, William is involved in that process. So, in a way, the coin-making business, the mint and the mining industry sort of go hand in hand and actually... Mexico at that time was a country that you could say was being exploited by companies and people from Europe for its mineral resources and particularly its silver. So how is this podcast going to work? Well it's very simple really the idea is I'm going to read extracts from William's journals and as I go I'm going to occasionally stop and spend a bit of time explaining what the reference is or what the people are or what the things that he's just mentioned are about. And um, also, you know, the odd comment about some of the opinions that he expresses at the time as well, which are fairly comical. And some of the incidents that happen, which are quite comical as well. Now, I should say that while I'm reading the actual words from the journal, I'm going to adopt the what I think a Victorian gentleman would have sounded like voice. So it may sound a bit hammy, but I am a bit of a ham, so <laughs> forgive me for doing that. The main reason for doing that is I don't know anything about William's education. I do know a little bit about his background. I know that he was born in Berwick upon Tweed, very near the Scottish border, in 1801. Um, this is because actually he usefully provides a bit of genealogy about his own background in the journals. And he must have been quite well educated, obviously, to become a fairly respected engineer, able to get these, I would say, relatively high profile jobs for the time. I don't think he spent that much time in Berwick. He later refers to time in Norfolk and in York and then in London as well. So I've kind of just assumed that he was probably quite posh or he was upwardly mobile, shall we say, and trying to be posh. Not that people from Berwick can't be posh, of course. <laughs> No, no, no. But from a friend of mine who lived in Berwick for a while, he says that it's almost a kind of cross between a Scottish and Geordie accent, which I think is pretty hard to uh, capture and even harder for me to maintain over a long period of time. So that is the other reason I'm going to read it in this manner. And also, I think it kind of expresses a bit of the tone in which the journals themselves are written. There is a sense of a Victorian manner of speaking that we've become familiar with with endless television history dramas so that's that's the reason i'm going to do it that way so in this opening podcast 
I'll just explain this first one that covers the journey from London down through Kent, county I'm very, very familiar with because that's where I live now. And actually the house that I live in and doing these podcasts from was actually built by my grandfather, Archibald, who was a solicitor. And he got a bit of money and managed to build this house. It's not a big house, but it obviously has a long history with family, which I'm sorry to bore you with again, but sometimes it is useful to refer to it. And funny enough, from what I can see in the records, um, Edward, my great-grandfather, was also a solicitor. So that suggests why Archibald became a solicitor too. Passed down the family business, as it were. So changed from being engineers to solicitors. Anyway, the first part of the journey is through Kent, mainly by stagecoach, because at this time there's very little railways in the UK. They're only just being built. And then William takes a paddle steamer across the channel into France, landing at Boulogne. So that's the journey the first episode covers, and then we'll start carrying on from there with the subsequent episodes. Apologies for the very, very long introduction of this first podcast. I've really tried to keep it as concise as possible, but try to explain everything, the background, who William was, the journals themselves, I think is important. And if you ever need to be reminded of William and his character and things like that, you can listen to it again, I suppose, and listen to me droning on <laughs> about it all. But I, I think I have to give these journals a bit of context and I have to explain it in the beginning. So I do apologise for that. It does get better and there will be less of me yapping away. And as I say, also, when I'm reading the extracts, occasionally I will just very, very briefly stop to explain a particular word or term because there are expressions and words in there that are antiquated to us that we don't really understand or we wouldn't use in that way anymore. Sometimes the words are so obscure they've really faded into history so they need explaining. I should also mention at this point that if you do occasionally in the background hear the odd shriek or wail or scream, it's probably my darling children. Um, despite my best efforts, I've tried to edit background noises out of the recording, but occasionally they, they creep in and it's very hard to edit them out. So <laughs> if there's the odd erroneous, as I say, offstage noise, that will be them, along with um, the occasional car going rather fast along the street in front of us. As I've said before, this is being recorded in my house, not in a professional recording studio. So unfortunately, these things do creep in, but I uh, hope they won't detract from <laughs> your enjoyment of listening. And who knows, maybe at some point I might even be able to get some self-contained sound booth in which I can cocoon myself away from the outside world so i do hope you enjoy listening to this first episode do stick with it once we get past this initial period then you can listen more entirely to the thoughts and comments of william as he travels just to lastly say the journals are written almost in a daily entry way not quite that but along those lines there are no chapter headings or no particular demarcated sections if you like other than the three volumes it is just a very much chronological account of what's happening both in the recollections journals and in the third mexican journal anyway i will end this point of the podcast now and let's embark on the journey with william i do hope you enjoy listening to it and you'll get as much out of it as i have discovering about this world of the mid 19th century mm -hmm. 